Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Beef and Lamb Genetics Virtual Sheep Breeders Forum. Thank you all for taking time out of your evenings to join us to hear some interesting perspectives from industry experts, both local and international, as well as updates on the genetic analysis that brings us all together. First of all, I'd like to just go through a few housekeeping notes. Please, if you haven't already, um, ensure your video is off and mute yourselves. You can do this on the bottom left of your screens by clicking the mute and stop video icons shown on the screen. It will allow us to maintain a better connection throughout the webinar. Along the bottom ribbon of your screens, you will also see the chat icon. Please utilize the chat function for all questions throughout the presentations, and I will circle back to these at the conclusion of each talk for the speaker to answer. For, for best viewing, you can adjust your views along the top ribbon in order to see the speaker and their presentation at the same time. We suggest using speaker view in the top right corner of your screen in side-by-side -side mode. Select view options in the, middle, in the top middle of your screen, then select side-by-side -side mode in the drop-down list. If any of you need to leave us partway through the webinar, this is being recorded and there will be an email sent out on Friday containing a link to the video of this evening's event. There will be a couple of polls throughout the webinar asking you to select which out of a list of options best represents you or your enterprise. For those of you who joined us last week for the Low Input Progeny Test Field Day, you will be well practiced with these. But to give the rest of you a bit of a demo and to see who we have signed in here tonight, we'll run, we'll run the first couple now. The first poll should pop up in front of you now, which reads, which of these options best describes your involvement in the industry? Please read the options and we'll give you a few minutes to make your selection. A few more seconds for those who haven't quite got the chance to vote yet. Okay, so we look like we're majority breeders, which is no surprise, with also a hefty number of science and research partners with beef and lamb genetics. So that's really great to see uh, an extension of, of many parts of the industry here tonight. Uh, we'll also run a second poll now, um, asking you to let us know how many of you are watching tonight from your various computers or smart devices. Few more seconds for the last few. Okay, dokie. Most of you are on your own, but a few with a few friends, so that's cool. Great. Awesome to have you all with us. Right, before we get into the good stuff, I'll give you a brief rundown tonight of the lineup this evening and also a quick look at tomorrow. First up tonight, I will hand over to De uh, Dan Breyer, our Beef and Lamb Genetics General Manager, to officially welcome you all to the forum and to introduce himself to those who didn't get the chance to meet him at last year's roadshows. Then we will hear from Brian Wickham from NZAEL, followed on by the Low Input Progeny Test Flock Manager, Robert Peacock. Then we will hear from Andrew Morrison and Suzanne Rowe, who will share some insight around methane, and last but not least, this evening we'll hear from our very own David Campbell, who will give us an update on Improve. A quick look ahead to tomorrow, we will hear from Rob Banks around genomics. Sharon McIntyre will share with us a few cell updates. 
Cheryl Ann Newman will share some of her research around the DPX index, and Tricia Johnson will give us a, an update on meat quality and feed efficiency. To conclude tomorrow, we are planning an interactive feedback session where we will ask you all to provide feedback on what you would like to see out of beef and lamb genetics in the future. This may include emerging traits or parameters for specific traits, updates to the analysis, queries around indexes or suggestions for research. This is an opportunity for you to put forward suggestions to your breeder community. And I will, oh sorry, I will remind you all at the conclusion of the presentations tonight to think about what you might like to discuss in tomorrow's breeder feedback session. So to th kick things into gear, I'd like to throw to Dan Breyer, our beef and lamb farming and farming excellence um, general manager, as well as our beef and lamb genetics general manager to set the scene for this virtual forum and welcome our first speaker. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Sarah. Um, welcome everybody. This is, um, the, we were hoping to have this in Napier in person where we could um, all get together and, and spend time with the breeders and uh, life being as it is, we've transferred to this uh, forum. But welcome, welcome along. Um, we're really hoping that it's, it's very interactive. And so from, from you, um, if you can really make an effort to keep uh, into the polls, thinking about those ideas uh, that, so that we can use them to help us form uh, the direction of beef and lamb genetics as we move into the future. So um, in terms of what we've done, if we just move on to the next slide, it's been a few changes at Beef and Lamb Genetics. So I just thought I'd take the opportunity just to remind you who we are uh, and what we've got. So I'd also like to acknowledge the great work from some of the people who've moved on from Beef and Lamb Genetics. So people like Annie O'Connell, um, Graham Alder, uh, Eleanor Lincott, who have done a huge amount of work and we really respect and, and thank them for all of the good stuff they've done over the time. This is our team now. So um, I'm up there on the right. You'll also see Anna and Sarah who are there um, farmer facing positions are new to our organization. Jackie, you'll know, Susie, David, Pam, Cheryl Ann, um, Becky Campbell, and Becky Campbell needs a little bit of a special mention. She was uh, planning a, an event up in Napier that had taken a lot of time and energy to put together and she's very quickly helped us put this event together tonight. So thank you, Becky, for all your hard work there. Michael Lee, who many of you will know, and Sharon McIntyre, who we'll be hearing from later in the, um, in the program. So. Um, that's us. If you have any questions or you, or you want to touch base with any of us, we'd love to hear from you. It's great to see so many breeders along tonight. Great to see some commercial farmers too who have come to hear what we're doing and understand a little bit more about, um, about beef and lamb genetics and, and where our industry is heading. Um, one of the things I guess when I put my farm and excellence hat on from my beef and lamb role is that we know that breeders out here make some pretty brave decisions sometimes around breeding directions and uh, breeding objectives. And so I'm going to take the opportunity to thank the breeders as well for taking that risk on our behalf um, so that we can, as an industry, make um, genetic gain. Because as uh, Sam McIver reminds me, it's the interest that keeps on paying. So thank you for that. Right. And with that, we'll move into the first of our um, speakers. So one thing that we've had a bit of feedback from uh, breeders is they'd like to understand what's happening in other parts of the industry and other industries. So we um, are lucky enough to have with us Brian Wickham, who's going to talk to us about what's happening in the dairy industry in particular. Brian will be known to many of you. He's um, been in the industry um, a good time, um, doing lots of really good and interesting things. He's been involved with beef and lamb genetics over the years, has done some reviews of what we have done and, and where our direction should be going. Um, and he has NZAL, the New Zealand Animal Evaluation Limited, uh, is based in Dairy NZ and is very much a, a sister organisation to Beef and Lamb Genetics. So it's really interesting to see what they've been up to. Over to you, Brian. So th thank you, Dan. Um, you can just nod if I'm, you can hear me okay. Good. And I think I've got control of the screen. No. You should have, uh, Brian, if you um, click your mouse to advance. Click my mouse to advance. I don't have a mouse. I can see your mouse. Yep, perfect. I'll just take you back a slide. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Dan, um, and the introduction. Uh, I'm going to put this in a slightly personal perspective. 
Uh, I think it's easier for me to speak on behalf of myself and try and represent a whole industry, especially the dairy industry. Uh, so just a little bit about uh, my background. Um, born 1946, which is getting to be a little while ago, um, uh, uh, through Massey, um, PhD from Cornell 75. For 22 years, thereabouts, uh, with LIC and its predecessors. LIC uh, was preceded by Livestock Improvement Corporation and uh, back through to the Farm Production Division of the Dairy Board, which is where I had my first paid employment. Uh, during that period, my interests and work uh, were around the original database. Um, so that's where I cut my teeth and learned, learned about databases and the importance of a single copy of the truth. Uh, Interval was a project that I got involved with uh, to facilitate international exchange of um, information on uh, dairy bulls in particular worldwide. Uh, genomics uh, was an interest that I had uh, at LIC, uh, managing the original LIC partnership with others, uh, doing uh, at that time, I think we were calling it marker assisted selection. Uh, genetic evaluations, the BW, uh, was uh, part of my, uh, something I was involved with in the later stages at LIC and of course research. Uh, I then went to Ireland to um, take up the job of establishing the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation. And you will see how this experience has influenced my thinking. Uh, I often say that uh, I couldn't have done the Irish job with, without my experience in New Zealand. And I say the same thing today. I couldn't even think about doing the job I'm currently trying to do uh, without the Irish experience. Um, and just for you sheep breeders, um, uh, ICBF uh, in, came to include Sheep Ireland in 2009. Uh, so that combination now is providing the equivalent, if you like, of uh, NZAL, NZAEL and uh, Beef and Lamb Genetics for Ireland. So it's an integrated uh, structure. Uh, I retired from Chief Executive there 2012, working as a consultant, took on this job in on the 1st of February 2019. And so what I want to do is just sort of explain why an old guy like me would take on a challenge like this. Um, I was back here from, a, from Ireland in uh, 2018. Uh, the Dairy Industry Restructuring Act was uh, calling for submissions. Um, there was a good bit of discussion going on. I was being asked to get involved in various ways. Uh, so I put myself, put together for myself a list of, well, where, where did I think New Zealand uh, cattle, at least, uh, could do better. And uh, I use the word cattle carefully. Uh, for me, cattle uh, are those animals that produce milk and meat. Um, we tend in, in this country, and I'll make this point now, uh, have a peculiar situation where I work for the um, Dairy New Zealand, which is the owner of New Zealand Animal Evaluation Limited. It's called Dairy in New Zealand, but um, most of the beef uh, produced in New Zealand comes from the herds uh, that um, produce milk as well. So we, we have this peculiar structure uh, where our uh, production sector is divided according to a, a very arbitrary definition of end products. So I'll just make that point and move on. Um, one of the things that we've had in we had in Ireland um, for at least 15 years was just routine access to all the slaughter data uh, on cattle, and uh, that's an absolute goldmine of data. And that was something I was conscious of that New Zealand didn't have, and still doesn't have. So there's an opportunity. Uh, LIC is very dominant in the dairy industry, as you are all aware. Um, Nate integration was a deficit as I saw it. And uh, I just again refer to my Irish experience. I arrived there in 98. Uh, some of you would, might recall that uh, BSE uh, um, was uh, in full flight at that stage. And 
the cattle industry of Europe was wondering how they were going to deal with this. Uh, they developed, amongst other things, a calf registration and traceability system, which is arguably second to none. And I compare that with where we are in New Zealand um, and its integration with the information we have for cattle breeding. Um, it, is, it is not good yet, um, yet that was one of the great assets uh, in establishing the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation. We can talk about more, more about that later. And so there was my sort of list um, <coughs> of why I took on the challenge. I want to now sort of just, again, this is a, a bit of a personal odyssey, um, uh, landing back into New Zealand, thinking and having the opportunity and perhaps slightly the luxury to think about, well, what does New Zealand need? Uh, or what does the primary sector need? And this is this is something that I put together with the help of Chris Kelly, uh, amongst the numerous discussions we've had. And it's just looking at the primary sector, sort of splitting it down the middle between the the species that uh, we depend on, uh, the plant species and the animal species, and how our animals uh, ultimately depend on the uh, the output of the plants uh, for feed. Um, you can see the species we're involved with and my list, I couldn't get them all on the screen, obviously. Uh, every one of those species is uh, potentially able to be improved uh, for these purposes through uh, a good breeding program. <coughs> and I'll give you some numbers, excuse me, shortly. <coughs> um, we depend on these species to produce a, a number of things which come off our farms, milk, meat, fiber, hides, velvet. Uh, the list is actually quite long. Uh, and each of those outputs go off to a processor and uh, get processed and distributed. Returning New Zealand for exports of the order of 48 uh, billion per year. So just, I just want to keep, the, keep that figure in mind. Um, genetic improvement can give us one, or two per, one to two percent uh, annual improvement. So somewhere in the order of half a billion to a billion a year if we could get uh, one to two percent improvement across those species for this primary sector. I think uh, and I believe that as a country uh, industry we have greatly undervalued the potential contribution of genetic improvement. That half a billion to a billion is a compound annual improvement that we can think about. So that's sort of at the very high level. And then I want to start dropping into some of the details. One of the questions uh, I was challenged with uh, soon after I started talking about the value of genetic improvement in the dairy industry uh, was, uh, can you put a number on it? Uh, what's the potential uh, to improve. This is some work that Peter Amer did for us, and you all know Peter Amer well, I'm sure. Um, and the figures highlighted, so we can just go straight to that, uh, is the potential value of extra genetic progress. If the annualized gains were to increase by 1% of the current industry value. So, so the, if you look at that column for dairy, uh, the current benefits annualized are about 300 million. Uh, another 1% gain would be worth of the order of 167 million. Uh, dairy beef, uh, uh, Peter's analysis was suggesting we're getting nothing from it at the moment, and potentially we could get another 15 million. So I just want you to keep in mind that 180 million a year, which is the prize uh, that uh, we are after, and this is how I would justify to the uh, the levy payers of Dairy New Zealand uh, why we need to be focusing on and doing a really good job in the genetic improvement space. Um, so how how might we get this 180 million? Um, and the way I would explain that is that I think there are sort of just opportunities in three areas. Um, one of them is the, yeah, if I click that, it should advance. Uh, 
the 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 big the big prize I think today is in the field of genomics. And as you know, this is a technology that's been around for 25 to 30 years. In the last 10 years, um, it's become, I guess, practical and has got to the point where it can deliver demonstrably, uh, inc uh, demonstrably large increases in the rates of genetic gain. Uh, we've seen that through the dairy industry worldwide. I like to sort of just relate back to, I said I worked for LIC in, uh, up until 1998. Uh, at that time, uh, I was involved in managing a, quite a big investment in genomics. From 98 to 2008, I was in Ireland, um, up to my eyeballs in everything but genomics, uh, trying to sort out databases and systems for collecting data and integrating the slaughterhouses. Um, so in 2008, the 50k Illumina chip came along uh, at the price of 300 euro per sample. Uh, and 12 months later, so having really done nothing on genomics for 10 years, it took us one year to implement a, a genomic evaluation and a, and a genomically based breeding program in Ireland. And, and so, and that uh, saved us, um, saved Ireland from great embarrassment because at the same time, one of the AI centers had been cleaned out by a disease. So they could only operate on the basis of young bulls. So the, the point I want to make is, is that genomics is moving rapidly. Uh, the potential is still uh, only partly realized, and I'm quite sure that uh, with uh, research investment that's going on and should go on, uh, there's a great deal of extra value to be captured uh, by dairy and dairy beef and arguably beef and all the other species that uh, make up pastoral New Zealand. The, the second is in the data and information space, and I'm sorry for this slide. Uh, but this is the practical reality that I live with, um, I have been living with for, since the 1st of uh, February uh, last year, 2019. This is currently how the dairy industry um, data and information system for cattle breeding and for uh, animal uh, management information is, is structured. I don't want to go into great detail about it. Um, DIGAD, Dairy Industry Good Animal Database, uh, was a four-phase project. Uh, phases one and two of the situation. Uh, phases three and four, um, the original idea was they would be completed some time ago. And uh, hopefully they'll be completed um, uh, later this year. And all that will do is uh, bring us to the point where we have uh, at least two information service providers, LIC and CRV, um, who are providing information services to farmers and collecting data from farmers, sending that through to the Dairy Industry Good Animal Database. Um, and notice the, the change for the breed societies, the shifted from being attached to LIC to being attached to DIGAD. Um, so, the, so there was my three areas of potential ways of delivering that 182 million, uh, uh, genomics, um, data and information and efficiencies. Arguably, this is a, an efficiency, there's an efficiency element to this. So let me move on. Um, when you take on a job like I've taken on, um, there are a heap of challenges. And I've just sort of tried to structure them a bit here. And the, the point I really want to make is there's a lot of them. Uh, they come at you from all directions. Um, and you really have to sit down and say, well, how am I going to make uh, uh, a sensible contribution? 
uh, in this sort of uh, scene. And so I just, I just really want to talk about a little bit about the steps we've taken in the last uh, 18 months. And uh, in essence, uh, it's as simple as one, two, three. Uh, one was where we started. Uh, two is where we got to in February of this year. And uh, getting to February of this year, so this is uh, a year in, involved us taking a whole bunch of um, steps. One of which was a software change for the animal evaluation system. Um, just an upgrade to the most recent version of LIC software for doing those evaluations. And there's a long list there. Uh, I don't plan to go through them in any detail. Um, you probably, uh, the one I would just highlight uh, is the very last one, that a, an absolute key element of what we've been doing over this last 18 months is to document. Uh, we've established a wiki for that, um, and there's the access and a password if you wanted to have a look at it. Uh, the, 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 this importance of document, documentation, I can't overemphasize. Um, what I picked up uh, was a system that wasn't well documented. And if it's not documented, you don't know how it works. So um, th there's a, just a short summary of 12 months. And, and of course, um, looking ahead, so this is number three is where do we want to get to in February of next year? Um, when you look at this, and I look at this right now, I think, my God, that's impossibly ambitious. Uh, we want to get to a, a single evaluation system for New Zealand dairy cattle that incorporates uh, genomics and all the appropriate phenotypes. One of the decisions we took, and this is about how we get ourselves independent of LIC software, uh, is that we've contracted uh, Theta Solutions uh, to use their tools, uh, Bolt and Tree. Uh, Bolt is the uh, tools for doing the evaluation calculations, and Tree is the tool for storing genotypes. Um, we are, as New Zealand, incredibly lucky to have um, the AL Ray Centre in here in Hamilton and this associated uh, operation that gives us tools that uh, uh, arguably are as good as any in the world. So that's, that's kind of uh, about as much as I want to say, Dan, and I, I would just welcome the opportunity for discussion. Or Sarah, Thanks, rather. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> That was um, really interesting. I mean, a statement like a 1% increase in genetic improvement could contribute roughly $44 million to our sheep industry is quite a compelling statement for our breeders to take home. So thank you very much for that. Um, I've got a question for you here, actually. Um, if you were to pick one of the successes you've seen in the dairy industry through genetic technologies and evaluation, um, which could be applied to the sheep industry, what would that be? You, you said technologies. My, my example is not a technology, Sarah. <laughs> my, the, the one thing is collaboration. Um, and, and I mean, I, I have to say that when I sort of landed in uh, on February 1st last year, I didn't feel as though we had a collaborative environment. Um, and by September last year, we, we had a, a collaboration working. And it was just amazing how much we could get done. Um, and, you know, collaboration is about trusting each other, being able to share the data, being able to share our knowledge, being able to document it. So if there's one technology I'd, <laughs> I'd come back to, it's, it's, it's figure out how we're going to work together in order to deliver something better for uh, our farmers. Absolutely. Where do you see the biggest opportunity for the dairy industry going forward now? Uh, it's, still, it's still, I mean, for me, it's with genomics. Uh, genomics is it's a new technology. Uh, it's got enormous potential. Um, you know, when you think about it, we're, we're actually finally getting pretty close to the 
the actual mechanism that determines how our animals do everything they do, which is you know fundamentally what genetics is all about. And and I honestly think we're still undervaluing the potential that's there, and probably underinvesting in in that technology. I've had a um, a viewer question come through, Brian. Um, will you look at collaboration and shared data with Breed Plan? So we, this a, it's a good question, um, and I, I kind of um, am a bit inclined to uh, tell a little story about Ireland. Um, and in Ireland, when we were establishing the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation, which was a dairy beef integrated system, um, some of the breed societies were saying, why don't we use breed plan? Um, and as you can imagine, the position I was in saying, well, actually, I'm not sure that's going to work very well. And um, I succeeded in persuading them to stick with us and go for the integrated database. Since then, um, I've come to know breed plan perhaps better um, and breed plans evolved. And I, I view it as a, um, a capability uh, that we need to think about how we collaborate with uh, and how we learn from each other. Uh, we might use some of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, what's in breed plan is data from New Zealand farms. And we need to figure out how we're going to uh, uh, expand that data, because I mean, the breed plan is fundamentally a seed stock system. Uh, the approach we took in Ireland was, look, we're, we're um, breeding cattle for everybody, commercial producers. And that's where the NATE type link up uh, is the gold mine. So in Ireland, every beef animal that goes to slaughter, uh, whether it came from the seed stock or it came from a commercial producer, you know, it gets a tag put in its ear when it's born and uh, we actually know where it was slaughtered and how it graded and um, filling in all the gaps is quite uh, straightforward. So absolutely look forward to working with breed plan in any way we possibly can. Yeah, great. Um, can you comment on any novel or new traits that the dairy or sheep industry should adopt or be aware of? So one of those lists of challenges you saw, greenhouse gases and all the environmental things, um, there's certainly a lot in there that we have yet to do. Um, and I just go back and give you the, another little Irish story, if you don't mind. Um, the Irish have genotyped uh, 2 million cattle so far, um, and they've only got a population of a million dairy and a, a, a little bit less than a million beef cattle. Um, and that's all been justified on the grounds of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So if it was, you know, there's, there's what at least one country uh, thinks is worth doing as a new trait. Um, and it's, it's not methane measured as such, but it's about improving the, the footprint of uh, cattle in, in that particular situation. And, and we certainly need to be doing something in that space. Yeah, great. A question came through, how do you keep an industry good database together once formed and keep it relevant for all users? We all know decision by committee becomes less agile and genetic selection needs to be agile and bold. So I, I, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, uh, but it comes with a whole bunch of statements that are built into it. Um, and, and one of the things that I found with the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation is the integrated database uh, was capable of much more rapid innovation uh, than a, I hesitate to word, use the word, but a shambles, uh, which is kind of the, op the, the alternative to it. And so for example, um, BVD eradication um, in Ireland, you know, it's a relatively simple test to pick up the PIs. That was uh, the, the um, the veterinarians had the choice as to how they would do that through the, the NATE equivalent in Ireland or through the cattle breeding database. And they chose the cattle breeding database because uh, it was much more responsive, much more innovative. Um, and, and I think at the end of the day, the way you do that is focusing on the uh, 
doing the right thing for farmers. And not, not for a committee, you do it for the right thing for the farmers. And I guess that's the point, is that uh, it doesn't have to be a, uh, an amorphous committee that's uh, lost doing things that are ir irrelevant, quite the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. Can you comment on genetic tests like A2? Does it have an impact on overall genetic gain? Uh, well, you see, the the thing that um, it's, it's a good question because in the day, genetic gain is is an economic thing, um, and ultimately, it's how we breed animals to be uh, more profitable. Is the only way to put it. So, if you've got a somebody that's prepared to pay you more for milk that's got A two, um, and they'll pay you for enough, pay you enough for it, then it's worth. Uh, losing perhaps a little bit of gain in volume or uh, fat percent or some other trait because the the value of the milk is is worth will pay that cost no problems yeah great who pays for maintaining the reference population for genetic tools in the future uh, very good question <laughs> i mean ultimately uh, there are only for me there are three possible payers uh, one of the uh, so let me just identify those service users so um, it's paid for uh, by the ai company then they when they include it in the price of the semen is one place of paying for it uh, the second is at an industry level so levies um, and the third are taxpayers um, and when you when you think about training populations and reference populations they are quite long term in terms of what they do and in my i would argue there's a sort of a nice combination of those three sources of funds uh, because reference populations are also very useful uh, research tools and the returns are quite long term they're spread across all the commercial players and it's unreasonable to expect that one commercial player will pay for the whole thing for everybody else to, to ride on the back of so you need to you need to get a good model in there somehow yeah absolutely oh well, thank you very much brian for your time this evening it's been a really interesting insight so thank you very much for joining us thank you our next speaker, many of you will have heard from last week at last week's virtual field day around the exciting project that is the Beef and Lamb Genetics Low Input Sheep Progeny Test. The progeny test is run at Arari Gorge Station by Robert Peacock and his team and is a partnership between leading breeders focused on improving animal welfare and livestock emissions and a MPI Sustainable Farming Fund. The progeny test has been underway for a little over a year, where we are working towards identifying animals which require minimal intervention through drenches and treatments, which are more robust to com combat specific diseases, and importantly, are feed efficient with reduced methane outputs. Robert will take us through an overview of the progeny test, identifying some of the key traits measured and highlighting some of the results from the first year of the trial. Welcome, Robert. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my presentation is going to be a little bit shorter than last week, so apologies if I speak a little bit quickly. Uh, just a quick background on Arari Gorge Station. Uh, we're located uh, just north of Geraldine uh, in South Canterbury. We're roughly 10% uh, river flats, 15% rolling down to lower hill, some of it quite steep, and 75% uh, tussock steep hill country. Um, so the slides, I oh, know they're going a bit slowly. Um, so we're running um, 75, uh, sorry, 50% sheep, 25% cattle, and 25% deer. Uh, we get plenty of rain, um, 1,200 mils a year, which is generally summer safe, um, which in turn relies to a pretty um, good climate for worms. And so internal parasites have uh, been a passion of mine for quite a long time. Um, and 
<clears throat> and that leads on to, to the project really. So why did I want to be involved in the project? Well, this started uh, two or three years ago at the Sheep Breeder Forum, the last time it was in Napier. And um, a special thanks to the likes of David Reed, Alan Richardson, uh, Daniel Wheeler and Kate Broadbent who have been on the steering committee for um, a good year or two before we actually got the go ahead to, to make this happen. Um, at the end of the day, uh, drench resistance is a growing problem. Um, we've got pretty large percentage of New Zealand farms have got resistance to triple combination drenches now. Um, the consumers don't want the chemicals in the food, the chemicals aren't working, and it's also getting harder and harder to find the workers um, to do the work, both the, the drenching, the dagging, um, even the shearing, the tailing, everything. Uh, so to me, low input is, is the only way, and the genetics are quite a large part of that low input. It also feeds in well to the, um, the clean green New Zealand image. Um, if we're gonna be profitable sheep farmers and beef farmers, we need to have a product that is superior to other countries. We need to have a point of difference that we can market to, to the world. Um, so we started um, with an AI program uh, in 2019, so just over 12 months ago. Um, and the goal was to measure the traits you can see there. So tail length, tail skin, dag scoring, uh, bare wool around the bridge, feed clag counting, parasite resistance, parasite resilience, and also hog at estrus. And then moving on to slightly more research, the feed efficiency and the methane production. So uh, last year we AI'd, we um, put cedars in 1100 of my own commercial Romney ewes and we AI'd just under a thousand of them that cycled at the right time to 17 different rams that you can see there from all sorts of breeds. Um, now I would um, just like to make a, a couple of comments here. Of, um, I mean, I. I did, I'm mean, very passionate about this subject and I did want to be involved. The main reason I put my hand up to host it was because I was worried that it might not go ahead if someone didn't volunteer to host it, having just about um, received the funding uh, two years ago. Um, it was hoped that Teratahi would, um, would host it or possibly at um, the um, well, the name escapes me, the, the Southland branch of Teratahi. Unfortunately, um, that hit, hit the wall in um, December 2018, and so I stepped in to host it. Um, some people might think as a stud breeder, I might have a conflict of interest hosting a, a progeny trial involving studs. But to me, I've probably got the most to lose because everyone's looking at me and seeing how it's going and seeing whether it can be done. Um, but I was prepared to wear that because I really wanted to see this go ahead. Um, a comment also needs to be made about this project is the use were our own commercial use and we have done over 20 years of no drenching for our adult use. So ewe lamb replacements receive about three, maybe four drenches in their life and then that's it. Um, no adult use, get a drench. Um, so we were potentially starting off with a slightly higher level of, of resilience in the ewe flock when we started. If we'd hosted this on another property that had been a higher input property for a long time, we may have had some different results. Um, we're not quite sure. So we'll move on to the management. So as I mentioned last year, we AI'd just under a thousand ewes. Uh, this year, uh, because of COVID, um, AI was permitted, but it was 
uh, difficult without bringing extra labor on. So we AI'd just over 300 ewes to six sires, and we um, put 10 rams out with just over 700 ewes um, for natural mating. Um, they only had a condensed period to try and keep it in line with the AI, so they only got 10 days. And I'd just like to put a big thank you to Julia at Genetic Gains. Um, we managed a, an 85% hit rate on the AI, which I thought was pretty exceptional. Last year, we were pretty relieved when we got 70%. Um, yeah, scanning was, was a great day to find we actually were gonna have some lambs to measure. And this year is looking even better. Um, so 85% takes the AI and about 170% scanning. And the natural mated use also managed 85%, even though they only had 10 days. So we're looking to have more lambs for measuring next year, which is great. As there's Julia doing the AI. Um, so first of all, we had lambing. Uh, so the twins were on this sort of country in the foreground and the singles were on the hill country behind. So all lambed, totally unshepherded. Uh, we went around them about once a week um, just to check for cast and um, pick up any dead lambs. Um, and then we were on to tailing. Um, so at tailing, we DNA'd every lamb, we tagged every lamb, we um, measured every tail, and we measured the bare skin underneath the tail. Um, then at weaning, so we, we dag scored every lamb, we weighed every lamb. Uh, because some of the male lambs were particularly daggy, uh, we had to crutch them. And being a, a trial, you can't crutch a few without crutching them all. So we did crutch all the males. As you can see from this photo, the tails were left on all the male lambs. Because we're keeping the ewe lambs for replacements for the trial, uh, we did tail the ewe lambs. Um, they were all drenched and dipped at weaning. And we also added 20 of my own commercial uh, male lambs. Uh, all the males, both my own and the trial, were turned into crypt orchids. At, at tailing. Um, you'll see from the slides later on that my own born lambs were quite a bit lighter than the progeny trial lambs. That's because they were born several weeks later and up on the hill country rather than on the similar country. Um, but otherwise they were pretty similar. And then about four weeks after weaning, we brought them in and we drenched those control lambs, the 20 of my own lambs were the control lambs. So they were drenched after four weeks. Another three weeks later, we started weighing everything. So every time the progeny trial lambs were weighed, we would drench the control mob and all the progeny trial lambs remained undrenched. And both the girls and the boys managed to remain undrenched all the way through from December weaning right through to May. So the Males were slaughtered in May, having had no drench since December. And likewise, the females went to the teaser ram for hogged estrus marking um, without having had a drench. Um, we did dag scoring, we did worm counting, um, we did the resilience. Um, with the worm counting, um, I wanted to uh, measure every lamb individually in February and then again in May. Um, in February, the male lambs, their egg count wasn't high enough. So we had to put them under quite a bit of pressure trying to increase those worm counts. And as you'll see from the graphs later on, that did impact their growth rate. Um, and not just of the undrenched progeny trial lambs, but also of the control animals, purely because they, they weren't getting enough grass I try to make them graze down to ingest more worms. Um, you see a few difference in tail length here. Um, there was obviously a bit of a breed difference in tail length. Uh, there was 
um, your DAG scoring, you see some were DAGger than others. So this was in um, about the end of February. Uh, in March, all the females and the males were shorn. Uh, the boys were ultrasound, muscle scanned. Um, and then on the 1st of May, uh, teaser rams were joined with the ewe hoggets for about four weeks with, with harnesses on. Um, as you see, there's a variety in, in sizes, a variety in dags. See the dags there and clean bums there. So this is getting out over five months post their weaning drench now. Okay, so we'll move on to the results. Um, so just to clarify, these results are within flock analysis, and that's very important to take note of. Um, a lot of these rams were well used throughout the industry, and they will have lambs in other studs. Um, but that data was not allowed for in this because the other lambs they've had on other farms would have been under a, a higher input system, and that would have clouded the, the information for this low input trial. So these, all these results you're going to see are purely within flock on this trial. So they averaged um, between 20 and 30 male progeny and about 20 and 30 female progeny per sire. Um, so you can see the measured for um, growth, meat, feck, dags, and survival. Um, the center of the line is, is the average of the 17 sires, which is by default, it's almost zero, but, but not quite. So a red line to the left means they're below average, and a green line to the right means they're above average for that trait. Um, so there were um, three sires were above average for all five traits, and four sires were above average for four traits. But what's really important to note is that even of those sires that didn't perform that well, um, 29 progeny from 10 sires had above average um, results for all four traits. So even if the sire might have been slightly below average, he would still have lambs that were above average. And, um, and that's what breeding is all about. It's finding those ones that are above average and, and multiplying them up. Okay, so tail length. Um, we just, we'll go through these quite quickly. You've all had the uh, report um, emailed to you. If you haven't, then um, contact um, Sarah and um, she can forward it to you. So for this, um, the tail length, uh, a negative number is shorter. And for the tail skin, a bigger number means it's got a large amount of bare skin under the tail. Um, so this is the, the growth. And as you can see, the green line there is the progeny trial lambs and the blue line is the control mob. So as I mentioned earlier, they started quite a bit behind because they were younger. Um, in February, they flatlined because they were put under pressure. And then we worm counted them here on the 20th of February. And then you can see, even without drenching, um, as soon as we put them back onto better feed, they increased their growth rates again. And then again, they kept going through to the 20th of April. We did weigh them again at slaughter, but we haven't shown that part of the growth curve on this slide because um, the results were interfered with, with sexual activity. Although they were only boys in a single sex mob, um, some of them were a lot more hormonal than others. And some of them sort of actually lost weight during that period, but it wasn't the worms. You could tell it was the, the sexual activity that was complicating things. So you can see, yes, the, um, the progeny trial lambs grew well. Yes, the control mob grew faster, but there's um, one, two, three, four extra drenches they got. So significant cost in chemical and labor. 
Um, and if you look through this March period, um, even without the drench, the better feed, and it should be noted that better feed was actually in the form of clover. Uh, we do have some paddocks of pure red and white clover. And, um, and they were quite an eye opener as to just how quickly the lambs bounced back. Um, they only had a couple of weeks um, on the clover and then they were back onto the grass for the rest of the trial. Um, and whether it had the same result, if it had some really good grass, I'm not sure, but um, I put them on the clover and, um, and it worked. Um, so the parasite resistance, um, a big range. Um, so obviously uh, for the DPF, that's an index. So the bigger number, more positive number is desirable. For the um, breeding values, a higher negative number is more valuable. Um, so you can see here the FEC1 for the boys, it wasn't very high, it was only 463. So that was getting out to about nine weeks post their weaning drench. And they were weaned straight back onto the lambing paddocks and they still only had an egg count of 463. Um, but within that, the range was from zero up to over 2000. As time went on, in May, the egg count was up to two and a half thousand. And again, there was still some at zero. So you're over five months post the weaning drench and still some zeros. Meanwhile, there was some right out at 9,000. The girls were really interesting. The girls, similar grazing, but obviously just different paddocks. Um, even if you think you're doing things the same with different mobs, you're generally not. So they had a much higher worm count in February than the boys, but then without drenching, they had managed to bring that down on their own, um, more than halved it in fact, which was were quite impressive. Um, and again, some with zeros and the highest with 8,000. Uh, the DAG scoring, so there was a big range in DAGs, um, but it was worth noting that there would have been at least 10% that were absolutely spotless, um, five months post weaning drench and two months from shearing. So obviously they were clean at shearing in March, but um, good two months later in May, um, some of them were still clean. It is fair to say some of them were definitely not clean. Um, the shepherds deserve a big thank you for the crutching, we had to crutch them pre uh, going to the works and um, they weren't looking forward to that. There were, especially with long tails, it wasn't, wasn't easy. But as we mentioned earlier, every sire had some clean ones. They all had some above average. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so about the 19th of May, uh, we weighed them off everything over 35 kilos was sent for processing. Uh, there was only 17 out of um, oh, about 450 lambs that were under 35 kilos, which isn't bad. So almost 100% killed that was alive at weaning um, with a 19.4 carcass weight and a 55% yield. Uh, for the day, through the Alliance plant, 55% yield was actually slightly above the average for the day for male lambs, crypt orchid lambs going through the plant on that day in May. These lambs that hadn't been drenched for five months were still right up there with, with the average, if not slightly in front of the average. Um, fairly standard bell curve, especially for the yield, very, um, tight fitting bell curve around the yield. Uh, Hoggard estrus. So they, um, every ewe lamb was in one mob and the whole lot went to the ram. Uh, so teasers with harnesses, um, quite a frightening thing there. There was one under 30 kilos that was marked by the teaser. There was 33 under 35 that were marked. Um, you've got to remember this is, every ewe lamb 
weaned, was in was still here going to the ram. Um, in a normal commercial situation, you would have culled at least 20 or 30% of these before they'd gone to the ram. So without drenching for four and a half months by the 1st of May, if we'd culled the bottom 30%, um, they would have averaged um, about over 40 kilos, I think. I think the bottom weight would have been about 38 kilos, and that's without drenching, which I think is pretty impressive. And we're getting up at 70% um, marked um, over the whole lot. And if we look at the individual, there was quite a, a range in the percentage marked. Um, so this scatter graph here, the percentage marked on the, the left axis and the live weight along the bottom. So a ram like this one here, um, his ewe lamb daughters averaged a reasonable weight, but they didn't scan very well. Um, up here, we had one at 100%. Every one of his daughters was marked by the, the teaser. Um, so a reasonable correlation, live weight with estrus, as you'd expect, but there's obviously exceptions to the rule. Um, so key messages, uh, there's a lot of variation amongst the progeny. Even size that appeared average or below average, they still had some good progeny. Um, I think the key one is, is this third point, is the genetics made a massive difference. So it was, for every trait, there was a big difference between sires. Um, the tools were there, the breeders just need to get on and measure these traits so they can make some genetic gain. Um, they're, they're all heritable to different levels, um, but until you start recording it, you're, you're not gonna go anywhere. Okay, so we'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Robert. It's a really interesting progeny test, this one. And um, obviously, as you've just discussed, there's some, some pretty key traits that we can start looking at that are, are cheap to measure and are relatively heritable in a lot of cases, so we can make re relatively rapid progress. Um, in your observations so far, what are the most interesting um, results you've seen to date? Um, yeah, when we when we started, I, I never expected to get all the way through to May without without a drench. Um, so yeah, I was pleased with that. There's a balancing act. Um, if we'd started off the project saying, righto, let's see if we can get to May without drenching, I would have done the grazing a lot differently. We all know the majority of the worms live in the bottom of the sward. If you've got good grazing management, those lambs could be moving through the pasture, just grazing the top picking the clover out and other stock are coming through behind them. But that wasn't the purposely, not just the, the lambs, the male lambs for that three week period. But I mean, in general, they were often put under pressure um, to purposely challenge them and, and boost their worm count. Um, and they handled it. Um, yeah, a bit of help from some clover at times, but Majority of the time, they were just back on the standard sheep paddocks, um, grazing ryegrass in a climate that is pretty suited to worms. So, so that was um, the first take home message. And then, yeah, secondly, just the difference in the genetics, the difference between the sires. I mean, I've been pretty passionate about this topic for 20 plus years. Um, and this has only reinvigorated that passion even more. Um, as to how much we can do with the genetics and, and how much we need to do. Um, it's not easy getting shepherds. It's No one wants to be a shepherd so they can spend their time dagging sheep and drenching sheep. They want to be out sort of on the hill and doing the fun stuff. Yeah, for sure. Uh, now we've got a question about how you measured survival. We've got um, Sharon McIntyre on the call um, if you want to throw that one to her, but happy for you to have a, have a crack at that one, Robert. Yeah, so survival was, um, at, at scanning, we, we recorded the, the pregnancy scanning score. And then with the DNA of all the lambs um, alive at tailing, there was a, a simple calculation. So um, as long as the, the scanning was accurate, which it would have been pretty good, 
um, yeah, that was a pretty basic calculation, nothing too technical. Sharon, did you want to add anything to that one? No, the, the only thing to say is it's just survival direct, and so we don't have any family information. So the accuracy is actually quite low, only about 20%. So when I was looking at which sires were above average for the four traits, I excluded survival because of the low accuracy when it's measured like that. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that, Sharon. Um, another question. Um, did you do cultures on the fix to see which no nematode species the challenge was made up of? Um, no, it, it was split into nematodes and in general parasites, um, Sharon will probably have more information on that. So when you do the fix, you get the fecal air counts and you also get nematodirus one and two, but they weren't particularly high levels of nematodirus, but you do get both pieces of information and we use all that information. Great, thanks for that, Sharon. Um, people are often worried about fly strike with DAGs. Can you comment on your experience with this in this trial? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the research has been, been done that, yeah, I mean, there's a high correlation between fly and DAGs, sort of over 90%. Um, we didn't actually get any fly strike um, this year, so they were crutched and dipped at uh, weaning. Uh, the ewe lambs weren't crutched at weaning because they were shorter tailed, they were generally reasonably clean. Um, and we did a preventative because we weren't going to dag them we wanted to dag score them we did do another a follow-up dip in february at fecal egg counting um so yeah we we didn't um want to take it too extreme um, and start running around trying to rescue lambs um with fly strike so we did because we're measuring so many other things we did preventative dipping um they weren't dipped after shearing and still haven't been dipped so there was no issues despite a very mild may um april and may were very lush green grass here um which a lot of north Islanders probably don't want to hear but it was ideal for the trial because it did keep those worms coming and it did keep those dags coming but um we didn't dip them through that period and there was still no fly strike just along the fly strike um, vein as well, would it be possible to add fly strike as a measured trait for the current crop of lambs? Yeah, so, I mean, we'll, we'll keep discussing traits to measure with the committee and we're open to suggestions. Um, it just it just gets tricky when you're, you're not wanting to dag them. Um, if, you've, if you're leaving it too far approaching shearing, we were worried that if we'd left it any longer, and would had to start dipping them, it would have been too close for shearing for the withholding periods of the chemical. And so it just gets a bit complicated with, with that. If it wasn't for the withholding periods um, due to shearing, then yes, we probably would have brought, um, not dipped them that second time and just monitored the fly strike. But we've also got animal ethic issues, so we've got to keep um, ahead of the game there. Yeah, absolutely. Can you comment on your experience with AI? Was it more complicated or easier than you anticipated? Um, the year before I AI'd about 200 of my own use. Um, so I did have a bit of a understanding of what was involved. I think if I hadn't done that, um, I would have had a very rude awakening to how complicated it all was. There was a lot of mobs involved. Um, price of wool isn't great. And by sharing those AIUs were absolutely covered in different colored rattle um, because we're trying to keep everything separate um, and identified. So yes, it, it can be very complicated. It was spread over five days, um, averaging just about 200 use a day for five days. Um, but I mean, we had a good team. Everyone knew, understood the plan and um, it all went pretty smoothly really. Yeah, and this right. year doing 320 plus sort of about 100 of my own um have to say it was a walk in the park compared to last year 
Yeah, for sure. And final question, do you have Barber's poll worm in the South Island? There are reports of a few cases in the South Island, but as far as I know, we don't have it here. Great. We're going to come in on a truck to the South Island, but um, how well it's going to last, we don't know. Hopefully the weather will get it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for that, Robert. Really interesting insights again, um, and thank you for sharing. For those who um, haven't already seen the report that Robert's mentioning, um, we can email that out to you if you want to email us, or um, you can find it on the website. Um, now, we're actually going to run another poll just to follow on from Robert um, around low input traits. Which of these low input traits interest you the most? It is a multiple choice, so feel free to select more than one if, if you feel the need. Few more seconds just to get the last boats in. Okay, so it looks like we've got um, fecal parasite resistance as our front runner there. Um, not a particularly big surprise and similar to the results that we got last week at the low input uh, field day. Uh, feed efficiency creeping up there, which is great to see, and also dagginess, which again was another hot contender um, from the last week's virtual field day. Following on from the low input um, progeny test, another trait we're looking to measure within the progeny test is methane emissions. Now we will hear from Andrew Morrison, our Beef and Lamb New Zealand Chair, to give us a perspective on the importance of methane in our sector, followed on by Suzanne Rowe of Ag Research, who will give us some global insight into what is happening around methane, what has been achieved to date, and how you as breeders can get involved in testing your own animals. Welcome, Andrew. Hi, breeders. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks, Andrew. Cool. Hey, look, thank you for having me on tonight. I'm sort of sitting here with two hats on. I'm the Chairman of Beef and Lamb New Zealand, but I'm also a Director on PGGRC, uh, the entity that's been spending a bunch of money uh, looking at solutions for the methane issue. Um, you'll be well aware PG Pastoral Greenhouse Gas Research Consortium is a research consortium, MB partnership we've been running since 2003, looking at solutions for methane mitigation. Uh, we're doing a bunch of work around vaccines, inhibitors, feeds, and the one we're talking about tonight is genetics. One of the challenges we've got is um, whenever you find these solutions, you've got to look at your commercialization partners. And so that's what we're kind of here speaking to you about tonight is the program itself, plus the fact that BLG is effectively the commercialization partner. So on the call tonight, you do have Mark Aspen, who is the uh, general manager of the the, the consortium, and you have Dan Breuer, who is the Beef and Lamb Farming Excellence GM, who looks after our genetics program. Why is this important? Um, simplistically, um, we've been looking for solutions since 2003 because we thought um, this would be the way that the world was headed. Like it or not like it, um, the rest of New Zealand is in an emissions trading scheme of some sort. At the moment, agriculture is not in an emissions trading scheme. And you'll be aware that the climate change response bill, I think it was called, I always forget the names of these things, was passed last year. Yeah, the Climate Change Response Amendment Act was passed last year with a target of methane reduction, 10% by 2030, and still to be decided on 24 to 47% by 2050. Um, 
they wanted to put us into an ETS or a tax processor levy on the level on day one. We've negotiated a what we call Haywaka Ekinawa. The process involved there is industry and government is partnered to come up with a system where we can measure the greenhouse gases at a farm level. And that will be recognising things like your what we call liabilities, which will be your nitrous oxides or your methanes or your carbons. And we will be measuring your assets, which will be like your sequestrations uh, of trees or um, retired areas. But the other thing is we need to build in the fact that if you'll be using genetics, vaccines or inhibitors as they come on stream. So that's just kind of giving you some context around why we're doing this work and why it's important. One of the real challenges for you guys is when do we start engaging in this stuff? Because it's like a chicken and egg thing. Or oh, what's the price of carbon? Why would I do this? Seriously, what's the price to me? Um, versus what's the uh, investment I'm going to have to make in this space? which was sort of kind of an unknown space. But now we have the known methane reduction targets and we do have the known prices around carbon. So the, the, the ducks are starting to line up to give us an indication why we should be doing this. So look, I'm glad the research consortium's invested in this and I'll pass on to Dr. Rowe now to just talk us through the process of, of establishing the, the breeding values. Thanks, Andrew. See if I can get this to work. Just be a wee delay there while it hands control over, Suzanne. Aha, here we are. Okay, so um, thanks ever so much for giving me the opportunity to, to speak tonight. Um, I lead a, a program looking at uh, breeding for low methane emissions, but um, I'm only the current leader. Um, I'm sort of um, successor to uh, many faces that you'll be familiar with, um, not least John McEwen, who's been running this program for, for a very long time. Um, and the reason I'm here is because, um, as I'm sure you will have heard, um, the, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in New Zealand, 50% uh, of that or 44% of that is methane, but 80% of that methane is made up of enteric emissions. So that's where our ruminant livestock are taking in feed into, into the rumen, into the full stomach. It's being digested by a bunch of microbes. So that's just a host fat for all these microbes. That's fermenting the, the feed into um, volatile fatty acids, which we need for, for milk and meat production. And whilst that fermentation is going on, uh, hydrogen's being kicked out, um, oxygen's being kicked out, and it's all being combined as a waste product uh, to produce methane. And the animal really efficiently belches this out. Uh, so it comes out the front end. Um, and there, there are different fermentations. So um, we're involved in, in breeding, but just to say that the crux of the matter really is it, it, in the rumen, um, it, it, it is the microbes um, and, and probably the host control of the microbes that's, that's having the, the, the biggest effect on that fermentation and on the amount of these sort of waste products, these uh, hydrogens that are being kicked out as methane. So, um, I'm just going to have a very, very quick description of the, of, the, of the program to date, and that is that central progeny test animals from, from across New Zealand, purposely to make the, the program relevant for, for the results that would come out. Uh, a thousand of these were put through respiration chambers over a number of years, so that's a, a thousand dollar phenotype done over two days, uh, two weeks later, two days again, so that's a, a big investment uh, by the NZAGRC and the PGGRC uh, starting 10 years ago. And basically the top and the bottom were picked. So uh, selection lines. So we've got 100 ewes that are in the low line and 100 ewes in the high line. Uh, we produce rams from those lines every year. And we've been, they closed and we've been breeding them for the last few years. Uh, so we're almost up to um, the end of the second generation now. And they differ by about 11% in their methane per unit of feed eaten. So the amount of dry matter that goes in, uh, we're, we're measuring how much methane is produced when a unit of feed is eaten, it is digested. And the reason that we do that is because if we just bred for low methane, all we do is breed animals that didn't eat very much because it's a product of eating. So um, we've got these selection lines. That tells us a lot. That tells us that we can breed for it, that it's heritable, and we have variants components to, to move forward with. Um, and we've tested this system uh, in various ways 
obviously one of those most important things was to get those animals out of the respiration chambers uh, onto pasture or fed cut pasture and make sure that it worked in a grazing uh, scenario and 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 we've done that and, and the results hold up so um, finally pretty much on on the selection lines um, what we did was look at uh, we've been looking at maternal worth uh, over the years the blue line is the um, CPT. The orange line up here is uh, flock 2638. So that's the AgriSearch Woodlands research flock. Uh, this green line is um, the heritability of the trait. Sorry, that's just popped up. Uh, so methane is, is 0.3 and methane yield is, is, is around 0.2. Um, so this green line is the, is the low emitting animals and they're tracking pretty well um, up here for maternal worth. And the red line is the, is the high emitters. Um, and, and what we're basically seeing is, is, is a bit of difference around growth. So um, we seem to get more lean growth in the low emitters. That makes sense from a physiological point of view because um, we're hypothesizing that actually they've got more propionate being produced for the fermentation. Um, so we, we, get a, we get more lean um, meat yield. Um, we seem to have um, a lot more wool being grown and we think that's something to do with um, not only the fatty acid but the amino acid profile from that fermentation and we're seeing a bit more parasite resistance. So um, I think we're being careful not to sell that as the, as the lows are higher than the highs because we're only using four size a year. There's probably some uh, effects in there that, that are based on, on the progenitors. So the conclusion that we've pretty much come to um, is that we're not doing any harm. There's no obvious reason why we wouldn't use a low emitter. We can breed for her and she's healthy and she's productive. Um, and next steps within the research program will be to continue to look at um, how, we, how we breed, how we predict, so um, breeding values with genomic prediction, to um, look at microbial predictions. So we've been taking uh, stomach samples from these animals. So um, we, we take a, an, an, an oral, um, so it's an oral stomach tubing. Um, we take 30 mils of that and we sequence around about 1% of all the microbes in the sheep rumen. And from that, we can come up with a prediction of methane that's, that's independent of the genomic prediction. And what we've actually been doing is looking at, at combining the two. So uh, we're also looking at milk fatty acid differences um, in the meat and in the muscle. Uh, we, we actually see those fatty acid differences, they come through pretty strongly. Uh, so we've got a, um, a trial at the moment, just looking at the, at the differences and not only looking at the impact of breeding for low methane and what that impact might have on the, the fatty acid profile of, of the meat and milk that we produce, but also the reverse. If the methane has an impact on the fatty acid profile, could we perhaps use fatty acid profiles to predict methane? Um, and, and would it be a sort of cheaper and, and, and uh, simpler test? So uh, constantly looking for ways to keep evaluating um, and also look at additivity of strategies. So um, up, up until this point, we've been um, just looking at breeding, but what we really want to know is if we get a low emitting uh, sheep and then we feed it uh, something that, you know, brassicas or crop or, or something that, that we would expect to see a change in the methane profile or we vaccinate it, what happens? Are the, do, do these um, strategies, are, are they additive and are they cumulative? So that's, that's where we are with the research. Um, conclusions, uh, most important for this group are that low methane can be passed on to the next generation. It's heritable, uh, has, a, has a heritability of around 0.2 to 0.3. Um, we haven't seen any detrimental side effects to date. Uh, we've only seen advantages, so, um, so we're really happy to keep going forward, but, but, but we're still going. So we've still got these selection lines and we're still pushing, we're still pushing the envelope uh, because we still want to be ahead of everybody else in the industry. So if something does fall over, we know about it before you guys have to face it. At the moment, we're seeing potential for lowered absolute methane emissions by around 1% per year. But as we've heard from, from many, it's like your credit card interest, it keeps building, it's cumulative. Um, but most importantly, because we have this great system in New Zealand, because we have breeding values, because we have selection indices, because we have a national system, we also have an accountable and measurable way to reduce methanes, methane at the farm gate. So, so we can do something about it ourselves. Uh, we, we don't have to you know, um, wait until, until post-product. So um, 
the biggest step on getting this onto farm and the biggest step in, in this research project, really being able to investigate what was going on with the trait was the movement from um, respiration chambers, which are hugely intensive and, and very expensive, but very, very accurate, was the move from that to a proxy that meant that we could measure a lot of animals. And that was these um, portable accumulation chambers, which is basically, it's a polycarbonate box. It's a very simple system. Um, they started off in Australia and, and we sort of uh, build a souped up model here. And it's a polycarbonate box. It's got a valve on the top um, and, and we use what we call an eagle. So that's just a, a, the sort of monitor or gas analyzer that you would take down a mine. And that eagle can, can measure uh, CO2, uh, oxygen and methane. So we have a valve on the top of the box. We have an extraction fan, which means that the cl there's clean air when the sheep goes in. Uh, it's hermetically sealed. So we pop the sheep into the chamber, we seal the door, uh, we measure uh, the gases at time zero, at 20 minutes, and at 40 minutes. And 40 minutes minus time zero in parts per million is, is the basically the, the phenotype that we take. And then we use some, some conversion factors, temperature on the day, um, and, and convert that into grams per day. So that gives us an estimate of grams per day for the sheep after being measured for one hour. Um, and then what we do is we, we measure the, the sheep again two weeks after that. The repeatability of the trait um, isn't that high. It's around about 0.3 to 0.4. So um, we get a lot of benefit from measuring the trait twice. And we've been measuring um, primarily sort of 10 month old lambs. And from there, we've, been, um, we've also been measuring adults and the correlation between the lamb and the adult is, is above um, 0.97 so it's really really high so what we're getting is a lifetime estimate of the um, daily methane production of that sheep or, or, or rather how they rank um, to each other so once, once we had that system in place and, and, and we could measure with these units the, the next step really was to make these units mobile um, so, so we have them at a, in a wool shed uh, at Woodlands, but what we really needed to do was, was make them mobile so we could, we could get out there and, and, and measure other sheep. Um, and that's what we've done. The, the, the guys in Lincoln, the engineering department, um, built this whopping great trailer. Um, it's big to pull, but, but, it, but it is within legal limits, so we can tow it around the country, and, and, and we do. Um, and basically there are um, 12 units mounted on, on this trailer um, and it's a really simple process of basically getting up the driveway, um, parking it uh, undercover in a shed and we can measure roughly 84 sheep a day uh, using this system. So just, just going, taking a step back, we've got these methane selection lines, uh, but now we've got these pack chambers, we've, we've measured other flocks, and actually these flocks are the, the central progeny test and uh, the, the, again, the, the Woodlands flock 2638, and, and this middle flock is, is the methane selection lines. So we've got a massive variance structure going on here because we've got the highs and the lows, uh, but what we can see is that in the other flocks, there's still variation. So that's what we're interested in. Is, is there variation in, in, in our flocks that we can select on now? And, and, and you know, what, what does a breeding value look like um, out in the flocks? So um, we decided to uh, move some of this to flock 2638. So we measured uh, the, the ram lambs. And what we basically decided to do was to uh, look at what would happen if we included methane into our maternal worth index uh, on the flock. And we've been doing that for the last two years. So we wanted to really put our money where our mouth is and say, well, OK, we, we've done it in selection lines. Now we're going to do it actually in, in the research flock itself. So generally, we made about 22 uh, ram lambs within our 750 ewes. Uh, so from the, from the male progeny, what we did was take the I'm jumping, take the, the best ram lamb from each sire. Um, and the way we selected that first was by ranking purely on maternal index. So um, it's um, maternal worth plus fat plus dags. And we, we, rank, we ranked it on maternal index and we looked at the uh, average uh, economic value merit for, for those 22 sons and it was about $36. 
Um, but when we looked at what our anticipated change in methane per generation was, it was about 1.69% going upwards. So um, we've, got, we've got a good maternal worth index, but we have increased methane. So then, then we included methane in our index. We took our maternal index, but we added methane in and we costed methane at $100 a ton uh, CO2 equivalent. And then we looked at what happened if we ranked these ram lambs and we chose them with an index that, that produced, that also had methane. And the average maternal worth came out at, at $35. So we dropped the dollar uh, per ram uh, in, in maternal worth by including methane. Um, if we included methane and we said we're gonna get paid for it at $100 a ton, actually, um, we we actually we we actually went up a, a dollar so so that there's there's offset going on there with the methane but the most important figure i think for for us was that the physical change in methane per generation was around about three and a half percent so we hadn't lost much when we when we ranked by maternal worth our picks one two and three generally we might go to pick two but we weren't suddenly going to the bottom of the maternal worth index uh, to choose the the low methane animals so including it in the index um, didn't make a big change to our selection process and it didn't have a big impact on production but it made really quite a substantial difference as in it changed the sign for what we were doing in terms of methane performance so um, we're, we're continuing that and, and as, as I've said we'll, we'll follow and you know hopefully we can put these figures up over the next few years and uh, you know make sure that they stand. So going back to uh, the research flocks and um, all the information that, that's come out of, of, of the data, uh, the, the parameters, the genetic correlations, um, looking for uh, individual markers, which we haven't found by the way. We've, we've ranked markers uh, for um, the uh, association with, with high and low methane, and we find very little that's um, of any size or effect. So, we, we take the top markers and, and we make sure that they're included in the latest SNP chips. So, so they are there, but as of yet, we haven't found any, any genes of large effect. But what we have done is combine all the knowledge that we have um, and written it into a model uh, in SIL uh, so as it can basically, every, everything that we know, uh, and this was planned right from the start of the program. It was always planned that uh, this was the way that it was gonna be disseminated. So as there's now basically, um, it's included as a, as a research BV and anybody um, who measures it, who puts the phenotype in or, or has a, um, a, a genotype can basically get a, a methane breeding value. So they can get a, um, a PAX-CH4 GBV and it's not a methane yield breeding value. And we did that purposely. Um, I've told you that we've been selecting on methane per unit of feed intake, but when it comes to putting methane into an index, um, we need to be aware of the fact that all the other traits are there to offset the, the methane. So um, you, you, you've already got things like body weight and growth. So, so we, can't, we can't go double counting by now putting a, a, a feed ratio trait in there, but you can get a, a, a trait uh, and, and you can get a, a, a methane uh, breeding value from SIL and, and what we would like to think is over the next few years once it's been measured well enough and, and we're comfortable that it will move into the mainstream system and it will move into an index. Um, so, so the plan is, is ranking for all. The, the plan is to be able to go out and measure as many animals as we can. Um, but I have said that we're only measuring 84 a day um, and there are a lot of sheep in New Zealand, so um, obviously 80, 84 a day is, is, is not going to cut it. Um, we need in some way to, to share the load and to, to roll this out in a way that means that everyone has a chance to get a BV. Um, and, and the way that we, we're looking is, is obviously genomics. Um, you know, some, similar to other traits uh, that we, we will measure representative animals and use um, DNA relatedness to, to estimate measures in relatives. Um, so obviously with genomic prediction, we need linkages. Uh, we need to make sure that the, the right animals are measured. People need to measure a representative uh, sample within their flock um, and to get a, a sensible accuracy given the trait, given the heritability, given the structure of the New Zealand sheep industry, uh, we are looking at needing around about 10,000 animals in the data set, in, in that sort of genomic training set to, to get an accuracy of around the 0.6 or somewhere, somewhere that we're comfortable with. Um, 
So that's pretty sobering. Um, just like, you know, anything that we do in, in science or research, it's um, two steps forward, uh, hallelujah, and then one step back as, as, as we figure out how, how we're going to make, make the next jump. Um, so we need a rollout that basically gives us 10,000 genotyped and phenotyped animals. Of course, we have the animals that we've done under research so far. Um, so, so that gives us a, a good start. But our estimate was that over the next three years, we need to measure another two and a half thousand per year that were representative of the national flock. And people have been engaging really, really well in this. Uh, there are many breeders who are already, um, you know, asking to measure their animals and, and, and getting good results. And, and we're looking at an industry support package. So um, PGGSC have, have come on board and, and been helping by, by supporting breeders. Uh, at the moment, the cost for two measures is, is $60, so it's $30 a measure. So this year, um, those with good uh, phenotyping, those with, uh, who had already genotyped, actually were, were able to apply to the PGGRC and get their second measure paid for. Um, so, so that's something that's, that's been really helpful in sort of driving this forward and, and getting support. It's often very difficult at, at, at this sort of late stage to, to get that final implementation push. So um, if you're a breeder and you're interested and you want to measure methane in your flock or a part of your flock, then you can uh, log on to www.methanebb.co.nz and there's a whole heap of information there on on what you need to do and basically there's there's a there's a form where you can register interest so you don't have to sign your life away you can you can look at the um, the SOPs the protocols you can look at how you need to feed your sheep for the weeks prior to and you do need to give them good cover for two or three weeks before they're measured they have to be fed properly and they have to be taken off at the appropriate time in order to get a, a good measure that's comparable with everyone else so there's some information there um, you can have a look at it register your interest and the next thing that will happen is that that Neville Amy's uh, Ag Research will call you up have a chat chat through the protocol with you um, and arrange either to get you more information, uh, uh, to have more discussion or to uh, get a list of the animals that you'd like to measure and do an allocation uh, so that we have statistical power to, to test differences and um, basically guide you through what's going to happen, when the trail is going to arrive, what the date looks like for you, what the date looks like two weeks later. Uh, and then we have um, a fantastic technician, uh, Barry Van Vliet, who will uh, call you up and ask you even more awkward questions like, can you get the trailer up your driveway and is the gate really wide enough? Um, and do you have cover? And, and if he gets on the trailer under the cover, will you bang his head? Um, but basically we'll, 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 we'll guide you through all the, all the practical issues around um, things like power and water and parking the trailer and, and, and getting things organized. Um, so uh, it's a team effort. It's going really well today. Um, We've had quite a few people on, on the trailer already and huge thanks to the people who have already engaged. Um, and, and you can see they're across New Zealand um, and, and have, have given, given up their time, um, paid to have their animals measured, started the program, taught us some lessons along the way. Um, and, and it's been really great working with these guys. Um, and Lime Hill School too, who've had their school sheet measured, uh, just so they can basically, yeah, the kids can can estimate their own methane, which is which has been been really rewarding actually, and really good fun. So I'm just going to leave you finally with we're not alone in this. Uh, globally, um, there are many countries that face the same challenges. So. Um, 56% of Norway's methane uh, comes from enteric emissions. Uh, it's probably something like 85% in Uruguay, um, uh, similar in, in Ireland. Uh, so there's, there's a program uh, called Grass to Gas that we're involved in. Uh, you'll recognize these chambers because they've actually been exported from New Zealand to other countries. So Ireland now has a trailer and they're looking at uh, the correlation of, of outside and inside measures. Uh, they're looking at, at timing and, and exploring different research questions. So we're collaborating. Um, Scotland is, is basically um, looking at feed efficiency and, and methane um, and, and, and ways to monitor feed intake. Uh, Uruguay is looking at feed efficiency. They've got um, an old fashioned type of um, pack trailer. So this is the, the same sort of system. Um, 
and and finally Norway has gone really souped up so um, they've taken 10 of these chambers they've been exported over to Norway and they've put them in a really fancy truck and I am reliably informed that there's a really good coffee machine in there which has caused all sorts of angst to us um, but basically they're measuring 3,000 of the, the Norwegian white sheep over two years and producing breeding values for, for Norway but but that they're, they're about about two years away. So um, we're all collaborating together on this. All the countries are combining data, looking at efficiencies, looking at prediction, um, and, and looking at really how we can come up with something that's, that's useful uh, on farm. And my final slide, what's next? This is, you know, talking to you guys. How can we um, appropriately measure uh, methane in, in your sheep flock and, and what does it look like? If, if we're going to be in, in any way accountable um, and, and we're going to be able to, to show the, the reductions that we've made, how will that look? Will it be a, a round team statement for the breeding values? Star ratings, how, how, do, we, how do we rate accuracy? Where, where does accuracy come in? Uh, what sort of tools are we using? Uh, we're talking to people like Overseer. Uh, should, should, it, should it come out through Overseer? Um, Basically, the, the, the floor is open from now on as to, to what we do next with the, with the information and, and the opportunity that we have. Um, and we are open to working with you guys to, you know, take it in, in whatever direction that, that, that you would like to. And finally, as I've said, a raft of people and a raft of funders involved um, in, in, in getting this across the line. So I think there's a few questions there for me. Thanks, Suzanne. It's such an interesting topic and something I'm sure we could listen to for a long time. Um, we certainly do have some questions coming through, um, one of which has been answered in the chat, but I think it's worth re-mentioning. Um, how many kilos of methane per annum between the top and bottom emitters? Um, so we are looking at something like a, a 20 to... 25% drop so um, so that the average is is 16 and the the highest emitters are probably pushing um, 18 or 19 and the lowest are down to sort of 11 or 12 um, so um, there's there's if, if we look at if we look at the percentage difference in, in the round breeding values um, we're probably up to sort of 25 to 30 percent between the, the lowest and the highest How long do you think before we have a meaningful commercial index? Um, I think it just depends on how quickly we can we can measure enough animals. But um, so a meaningful index is is no problem. Um, we've got enough data. The the problem is is how do we value carbon? Um, you know what what dollar value do we put on the index? So um, I think that question at the moment is is out of our hands. And I, I don't know if we want to rush into a dollar value either. So it's 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 a difficult one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the current protocol for measuring methane and progeny is very limiting for flocks breeding for feck and feed efficiency and FE. What can be done to simplify the protocol for these flocks? I don't know really. Um, so we're 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 pushing hard if we if we get enough data um and we keep evaluating you know maybe one day we can drop that second trait uh, second measure but at the moment it's really needed to keep the accuracy up we're looking at other proxies um the microbial sample looks like it's going to be a really good proxy in time um and we're looking at you know what ways that we can take that but at the moment i wish i could make it simpler and i wish i could w w wave a magic wand but but I can't. Um, we, we've, we've tried all sorts of variations and they didn't work. You know, at, at the moment, basically, we need a pretty strict protocol because it is about feeding, it is about gas emissions, and we have to stick to that good protocol to get decent results. So basically, you know, what we put in is what we get out. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, thanks, Suzanne. Um, there's a few extra questions that have come through, but we're sort of running a bit short on time, so we're going to work through those um, tomorrow night. Um, what we're going to do now is actually run a poll to ask you all um, what the main barriers are to measuring methane within your flock.
few more seconds to answer. Interesting, we can see a fairly diverse range of answers there. Um, return on investment for the breeder and their clients is, is just ahead of um, on-farm practicalities, including feed and in infrastructure limitations, uh, cost, and um, a few with the philosophical disagreement. So a really interesting topic with a lot of different viewpoints around it. So something that we'll um, no doubt hear more about tomorrow in um, our breeder feedback discussion. Thanks very much, Suzanne, for, for that presentation. Uh, finally, this evening, we're going to hear from Beef and Lamb Genetics' own David Campbell, who is going to give us a rundown on Improve, our much anticipated new genetics tool that will ultimately replace SIL. David will walk us through the commercial farmer screens, which will be available to industry for use this upcoming ram selling season. Over to you, David. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'll kick off with an update of the IMPROVE project. Uh, we'll do a quick look at the background of it, uh, then we'll switch and take a look at the commercial farmer or industry facing screens, and then we'll switch to the more sophisticated side and look at the breeder and bureau functionality and how that's coming along. In terms of the background of the project, apologies, we'll just get the uh, audio level on that sorted out. Just give us one minute. It's pretty interlinked with our objectives, which is really around a confident and profitable uh, sheep and beef industry. Um, and in terms of our role in delivering that, it's really around the, um, the infrastructure to, to enable those uh, profitable breeding choices. In terms of our funding, uh, the majority of that um, does come from commercial farmer levies. Um, and then on top of that, we have the breeder sell fees, and we also have some third party funding that comes in from other sources like RMPP. So we'll start off by looking at the industry facing um, or commercial farmer screens. The objectives for those were really, you know, a tool that could be picked up quick and easily um, pre sale time. Um, the, the, there was an objective there to, to make it multi-species, so we've kept that in the back of our mind, but you'll see in terms of what we're delivering today, it is, it is definitely sheep-centric. We, we obviously want to make sure it's going to work across all the different device types that everybody's using. Um, all that said though, making sure that we don't run roughshod across the role of the breeder in terms of ensuring that the animal's fit for purpose, free of faults, um, and suitable for the, for the commercial farmer's needs. In terms of the information that we're presenting, um, as we covered in the, the Sheep Breeder Forum and the last Sheep Breeder Forum, uh, we'll, we were to stick to the information that was being provided um, at that time or, or still today in Ramfinder. Um, we've pretty much stuck to that. Um, I know there were other ideas that breeders had in terms of additional information that would be useful to share. Uh, we haven't forgotten about that and we've still got the feedback from the um, the feedback we got from the, the last sheep breeder forum. But for now, we're just going to focus on, on doing a better job of surfacing the existing information before we come back and, and have those discussions with you about other information that, um, that you might want to make visible. Um, so to kick the project off, we started off with our commercial farmer workshops. So that was really um, sitting down with small groups of commercial farmers um, and they were right across the spectrum from, from those who were pretty green when it came to this sort of thing through to those that were, you know, regular users of, um, of RamFinder. And really just making sure that we could um, zoom in on some designs that, um, that a commercial farmer, you know, who may only use the system once or twice a year could sit down and would pretty quickly see how it worked and, and be able to get some useful information to, uh, to point them in the right direction. Um, so once we had um, completed that process, then the early versions of the tool were, uh, were put together and then we set about uh, going through our uh, breeder feedback and consulting process. 
Um, so that started off with the uh, preview link that we sent out um, last year, um, and we got a bit of feedback from that. Um, and we also ran through that at the roadshow, and we got more feedback uh, there. Um, and we applied a few changes, and we sent out the preview link in November, and then that developed even more feedback, and we applied more changes based on that uh, with the update that was sent in May. Um, and then since then, we've been receiving uh, more feedback again. Um, and so I'll pop up on screen um, the, the key messages that came through from that feedback. Um, we were incredibly uh, grateful for the response uh, from uh, breeders and bureaus in, in pulling all this together. Um, and everything that's on screen are changes that, that have been made and improved as a response to the, to the input that was provided. Uh, maybe one that's probably worth uh, calling out would be connectedness. So that does seem to be a, a topic that, um, that was probably the most contentious uh, on both sides. Um, uh, and it's probably a place too where we have actually deviated from what was being presented in RamFinder. Um, RamFinder really, if you weren't connected, was very, very limited in terms of what would be displayed. Whereas the point that's been made by many of the flocks where connectedness is a little more difficult um, is that they really should be discoverable. If they're recording a trait that's of interest to a commercial farmer, um, it's it's important and, and to be fair that you know they should should be there. So um, I won't um, go through it in this session. There's, there's previous information that we've sent out that covers those changes that we made. Um, but um, but you know we've got some more that we're working on as well. But hopefully you can sort of may recognise some of the feedback that you've provided there, and you'll see those changes in the videos that we've we've already sent out or in the demonstration that we're about to do. Uh, we've also got other work that's still in development. So there was an idea there of a start over button that should be there if you just want to reset and start again. Um, we've made some adjustments, or we're making some adjustments to the the tips that give um, uh, farmers that are coming in for the first time a, a good steer and a couple of trait icons there that we're, that we're updating to make a bit more intuitive uh, uh, adult size and lamb growth. And then we've, um, we've got some other topics that we're still working through exactly what we're going to do, but uh, we, we do think there's going to be some further adjustments to um, make sure that those unconnected flocks are still uh, being surfaced properly even when um, a, uh, a farmer moves the slider to say that's a trait of interest. Uh, we'll still stick to the agreed um, presentation where we don't show values that are not uh, comparable, that are not connected, but they sh those flocks, those still should be there and showing that they're recording those traits. So we're still working through the, the details of that, but there will be a further change coming. And we also have the, um, some work being done looking at the how the breed names are handled in terms of some of those branded breeds versus the generic breed names and making sure that the flocks are going to be discoverable there as well. So maybe the best thing now is to give you a quick look at those latest changes that have been made and then after that uh, some of the feedback we've had in terms of using this tool more from a breeder point of view than a commercial farmer point of view. So if I select, I'm um, looking for a maternal animal and I go to choose traits, you'll see that the slider systems in here are now a lot more straightforward. Uh, we got a bit of feedback from people that have found um, that it could be easy to accidentally move the, the top slider, effectively capping a trait when it was a trait of interest. Um, and there were some other interesting um, interactions that we found out about, depending on you know, um, some, you know, if you were fat fingered when clicking on things, um, what could happen. So when you first come in here, you'll see there's a single slider for each trait. So if I want to say be in the top half in New Zealand maternal worth, um, and let's say uh, survival is quite important to me, um, you can see it's a pretty, um, pretty safe environment to do that now. The number of animals will still drop down, depend, you know, as I select more and more sliders. Um, as opposed to the, the dual sliders that used to be there. Now you can still enable that by enabling expert mode up here. Um, and that's still useful. Um, so here we've said that, you know, we want to be right up in survival and use a maternal worth, but we might want that, uh, that top slider because we want to stay out of, say the top 20% um, or so of, of reproduction. So, 
um, based on the feedback that we got and some of the follow-up discussions, we think this is probably a, a better way of making sure it's a real safe place where if, a, if somebody comes in and they're not, you know, they're just sort of starting to move things in a hurry without necessarily uh, reading everything to keep those people safe so that they get, get valuable information. But, um, but for those that need the more advanced controls that, that, that you've got that button that you can click and, uh, and, and get what you need. Um, the next major change is that in the um, show breeders area, we had the, the displaying of the flock details was um, not right. It was around the wrong way. So we flop, uh, we swapped uh, the farm and, and flock details around here. And the other uh, bit of feedback we got is that it was pretty frustrating, particularly for breeders, um, not having the, the flock codes in there. So those have been added in. Um, and you can also, when you go to search up in here, if you enter a flock code or um, any of the details in here, that'll, that'll show up as well. So, um, so those are, are probably the, the major changes just in the, in the last release that we've put out. All the connectedness and the other changes that's already been covered in other videos uh, that we've already sent to you, so I'm not going to uh, waste your time with that tonight. Um, the, maybe just the other bit of feedback that we got uh, from uh, breeders about not looking at this tool through the eyes of a commercial farmer or one of their clients, but you know, for their own um, for their own use was um, that a few breeders had sort of commented that it was quite a handy tool when um, when they were looking at their own flock. I'll um, flag, let's just say this was my flock, um, and then switch it to only showing the flocks that are flagged, which is only mine. Now it means that um, me as a breeder, I can go in and move these sliders to set, say, a breeding objective of one of my clients or whatever it may be. Um, and then, and I'll put, and then when I go and have a look at the actual animals, uh, now the animals, you know, because it's just my flock that I've flagged, I'm effectively seeing the animals that are most well optimized within those sliders that I set, you know, will come up with the highest likeness numbers and, and be sitting at the top. Um, so it could be quite a handy tool when, you know, when you've got a client who's looking for a, a particular um, mixture of traits to be able to go in and, sit, and set that and then sort of get a almost like a customized uh, ranking of animals uh, available to you. Uh, the other thing that um, pretty unanimously all, all breeders and bureaus uh, commented on was that um, from their point of view, under, you know, everyone understood why it made more sense to show the percentile values uh, to the wider industry, but for their own use, um, everyone tends to think in terms of the actual index values. Uh, and so that was the other uh, common piece of feedback that we got is virtually every breeder and bureau when they were using this tool uh, was changing it to actually show index values, which, which uh, tended to make a bit more sense. So um, look, that was it really in terms of um, just, just covering off some of those key changes, the most recent key changes that we've just rolled out and, um, and, and a bit of that feedback we had in terms of some of the breeder specific ways that the, um, the industry facing or commercial farmer tools were being used uh, by breeders. Thanks for that, David. Um, now we'll just field some questions on the commercial farmer screens before we move on. Um, the first one that's come through is, why is the search filtered by year of birth rather than by whole flock? Yeah, um, so there's quite a bit of data that the tool's having to process in order to show the thousands of records that are, are being processed. So at the moment, by choosing um, that one year to limit the, the result set as a, as a way of us being able to make sure that the, the tool is performing uh, like you, you saw in the, uh, in the demo that we just looked at, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, in Ramfinder, you can you can go across year ranges rather than just being constrained into a single year. But we thought we better get the tool out, make sure it was quick and snappy to use, and then after that, we can look to see if we can optimize the uh, the performance behind the scenes to make it um, to you know to enable potentially new functionality. Yeah, cool. Um, could you describe how likeness is determined in Improve? 
Yeah, sure. So this um, this really comes from a lot of the discussions that were had around Ramfinder and you know some of the criticisms about how fair or not fair that was in the way that the flocks or the animals were were ordered, which was basically by the number of, of matching animals, which you know um, the criticism was that that was um, unfairly disadvantaging the smaller flocks. So the, the likeness concept was come up with where basically, you know, you saw when uh, I went and set the sliders to say, you know, what I was actually looking for uh, on my farm. Um, the improved tool then looks to see um, within a flock, all the animals within that flock that actually met that criteria, how well on average they were optimized within the sliders. So if I only set say two or three sliders, it's only looking at where your animals are sitting um, for those two or three traits, how close to the top on average your matching animals would be sitting, and then um, that, and then that sort of stretched out across a, um, a zero to a hundred range to to give that number. The list of individual animals that can be pulled out is that able to be exported into an Excel spreadsheet? I've got a feeling you might answer this shortly, but anyway, we'll yeah, go for now. Um, <laughs> comes up a lot of the time. Um, so um, there's been a lot of just, even before the tool was being built, the, that discussion was going on um, between breeders with us uh, around the Ramfinder tool. Um, the thinking there is, you know, I mean, what's the role of the tool? Is it to steer the commercial farmer to a breeder? Or, I mean, you know, they can't put them in a shopping cart and buy them, right? So, you know, where do you draw the line? And we did actually, in the first commercial farmer workshops, we did test this out. And the, the first um, mock-ups that we actually showed the commercial farmers didn't deliberately didn't include animals in it, um, but you know consistently, um, and and when the farmers asked, you know, how do I get to the animals, and we said, you know, well, you know, we, we're pointing you towards the breeders. That the feedback was pretty unanimous that in other species um, they know in other countries um, they can see those animals and they want to get a sense of what those example animals might look like. Yeah, great. Um, now, I don't think we've got any more questions on the commercial farmer screen. So now, conscious of time, I know we're near the end of our planned time frame for this evening. Uh, for those that are keen to hear more about the breeder and bureau functionalities of Improve, uh, please feel free to stick around for a few more minutes to hear on this from David now. I'll just get that going. Okay, so on to the last part of the Improve update, which is on that more sophisticated and much larger uh, piece of work around the breeder and uh, bureau data access. Uh, the project was very much around our objectives in terms of that infrastructure for um, enabling those breeding choices. Uh, we had and have the current SIL system, uh, over 20 years old, um, provided a lot of uh, valuable service over that time, but but is you know getting pretty long in the tooth and now becoming quite difficult um, for us to to maintain. Um, and so really about looking forward about you know how to move to a, a more modern and maintainable uh, set of technologies, uh, but but you know doing that in a way keeping in mind uh, people's expectations around you know, better access to data, more direct empowerment. But doing that in a way where we were also being realistic and thinking also about those breeders that, that may not be in that same position and, and making sure that we were able to bring them uh, with us as well. So we kicked off the set of workshops starting with some pretty high level ideas which we then started to um, refine as a set of mocks. You can see a video of one of those playing showing some of the design ideas that were worked through in those uh, breeder and bureau workshops. And, and all of that um, design was effectively then taken across and handed over to the development team that, that begun the, the build out. Um, we've sent through uh, updates that hopefully give you a pretty good idea of, of how that's been going and, and we'll have a quick look at, at, at an example in a minute. But maybe just before we go there, look at, at all of the development at a, at a high level and you'll see there's um, lots of, of different uh, components there uh, being worked on by the development team. In our original uh, plan, we had, had wanted to do a complete switch across from SIL to Improve, but the reality is for us, uh, you know, we're, we're not in that position at the moment, as, as you can see. And so we'll have a look at a little bit later on, but you'll see that we're 
uh, going to be looking to to follow a much more incremental approach uh, than what what we were originally looking at, and that'll be very much focused around uh, the bits that are in inside the box on screen, inside the blue box on screen at the moment, which are, are around the data access. So you know, it's it's about today what you'd refer to as your reports, but in improve we call views that gives you access to um, to your analytics and and um, and PDF reports. Um, so I'll give you just a, a real quick look at at that in action, and then we'll switch back and then look at the actual migration uh, that we're looking at, at between Arcel and Improve. So I'm um, inside Improve at the moment. I'm in my views, which are pretty similar to the reports that you would be receiving today from the SIL system. Uh, we'll make sure that when you come in, there's a, a bunch of standard views, you know, for your selection lists and summaries and things like that. And we've also put a bit of work in to also make sure that uh, that your bureau will also be able to go in, um, you know, based off maybe the reporting that you receive today, go in and, and make sure that, you know, some breeders want to be able to go and create everything from the ground up, but for those breeders that, you know, maybe you want to get access to the information but don't want to have to be responsible for setting it all up, that your bureau will be in a position to do that for you as well. But um, for now, I'm just going to use some of the, the stock standard uh, views that, that are in there. So let's say I'm a terminal breeder. So I'll go into terminal and I'm after a summary. And let's say bring up a, a dam summary. And you'll see in here this view has been set up with um, all the columns that you'd expect to see in a, in a terminal dam summary. Um, there's all the, the um, indexes across here. Um, you or your bureau could uh, customise this, you know, remove some, add others in, change the ordering, change the way it's sorted. Um, the criteria uh, that's being used to sort of filter down to the right information is over here and again that's all, all can be customised as well. Um, let's say that you uh, want to pull a copy of this down for later use, we can go and export that. In this case let's pull it out as an Excel file. So now uh, Improve's going to go ahead and create an actual Excel formatted file, so not a CSV that can have all those problems with data formats and leading zeros being deleted and, and things like that. Uh, so I can go ahead and open that and you'll see pretty quickly there's all my uh, data that, that you just saw in Improve quickly pulled out and available uh, for you to use in Excel in this example, maybe for further analysis or, or offline use. So hopefully that gives you a, a sense, just looking at one little snippet of, of the progress that's been made, um, you know, how far along the system is coming. Um, we're really focusing now on getting the, um, rem some of the remaining internal testing done and the uh, training and, and reference materials uh, put together before we can uh, push that out to bureaus ahead of, of the breeders. Um, so I guess thinking about that and that transition um, process, like I uh, said earlier, you know, I would presented this slide previously showing very much a big wholesale switch out of uh, Sell Across to Improve. Um, you know, given our, where we're at at the moment and that we're already in, in winter, uh, that's, that's not realistic. So in thinking about Sill, the way that works at the moment, um, you know, we've got the, the data coming in from the breeders making its way into SIL. We've got the evaluation and genotype uh, provider information coming in as well, and then the reports uh, coming out uh, through the bureaus to, to breeders. Um, so alongside that, we've got the improved components you've just been looking at that are being stood up. We've got the synchronization, the data synchronization processes. Um, uh, very close to completion, which means that as the data is coming into SIL, that in, in short order it's, it's being made available to improve so that we can get the, um, the reporting and analytics, getting those views uh, working for you and improve alongside the, um, the existing reporting inside SIL. Inside um, once we get that across the line, uh, we'll then turn our attention to the evaluation and genotype provider data and moving that across to improve. Uh, once we've made our way through that, uh, we would like to then start looking at, at um, decommissioning the reporting out of SIL 
uh, with the expectation that we'll have the reporting having been tr transitioned across and now coming from Improve. And really that just leaves the, the data um, loading of the, the recording and um, data coming in from the breeders being loaded into SIL and transitioning that across to, to making its way uh, into Improve. Um, once we've completed all of that, then uh, we'll, we can then look at, at decommissioning so So hopefully you can see you know, a much more sort of incremental uh, stepwise switch across from um, from SIL into Improve than, than what we've looked at in the past. And in terms of timing, uh, like you saw on the table before, uh, we're pretty close to being able to um, get the bureaus into there and we uh, really, really want to make sure we do that in July. Um, and then with limited um, breeder access kicking off in August, starting with the breeders that were involved in the bureaus. And then that will you know, sort of put us on the pathway to, to start uh, pushing out the reporting and analytics in, inside Improve. Um, and then while that's going on, we, we then have the day loading uh, components, which are pretty much completed developments to start um, pushing that out into the hands of, of uh, bureaus for, for their, you know, start using that, start testing that out. And then after that, we'll look at, at doing the same thing for the evaluation and the um, parentage and, and lab systems. So hopefully that gives you an idea of sort of chronologically how that's likely to, to fall. But from our point of view, you know, I guess a big part of it will come down to, you know, how well it goes, you know, how, how smoothly and, and how many issues that we run into, which will ultimately drive uh, what that timeline looks like. Um, testing obviously is going to be a big part of that. There's a huge amount of internal testing that's been going on and is still going on. You know, hundreds and hundreds of rules being pulled out of the the, the SIL system that have been built up over 20 years. So getting all those documented, implemented and improved and then um, having those um, tested as well. Um, and then the, you know, the next step that we're about to enter into obviously is uh, seeing how well that goes when we start actually pushing that, that, those new tools out uh, to breeders and bureaus. Uh, on the topic of bureaus, just to I guess reiterate what we've said uh, in the past, just the importance of that of that uh, institutional knowledge that we've got uh, in the bureau, bureau tier. Um, that, like I said earlier, you know, making sure that we've uh, have stopped and built in the functionality, um, which you'll you'll see when we uh, deploy out the the data consumption components, the analytics and reporting to make sure that the bureaus are there and able to um, set those things up for you and, and help out um, where, where it's needed. Um, and, and again, you know, their, their key role in terms of keeping an eye on the data that's been coming through and, and you know, the way that that feeds into the preserving the integrity of the evaluation as well. So look, that, that's everything from my side in terms of uh, a quick update on the two different parts of, of Improve. So I'll uh, wrap that up now and we'll, we'll stop for questions. Thanks everyone. Thanks for that, David. Um, now a few questions. Um, I think we'll revisit um, the question asked earlier um, regarding the list of animals that can be pulled out, um, the ability to export into an Excel spreadsheet for own breeder use or for, for clients and customers. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I uh, missed, missed the point of that question. So yeah, um, um, there's been a wee bit of criticism in the past over, um, you know, whether we were exposing too much information. And if this was really just to give you an idea of the sorts of animals that are available, um, the, we have had feedback from, from our breeders and commercial farmers about an export function, but we thought sort of showing the first 100 animals, which is what happens in there, was a good way of just really sticking to, you know, that line of just showing you the types of animals as opposed to doing a sort of a wholesale dump and sort of trying to skip past the actual process of consulting with the breeder. Um, we're, we're continue, you know, like it's just a starting position that we've we've taken based on the discussions with breeders and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll continue to have that discussion. So if anyone's got any, any feedback um, in either direction, uh, we'd, we'd welcome those conversations. Great. Um, now, will breeders be able to enter data straight onto Improve? Um, the plan for Improve is yes, that breeders will be able to, to, to directly load data into Improve, and it's been built with that in mind right from the beginning. 
but um, that doesn't mean that the data moves straight through um, without um, undergoing you know validation and, and inspection uh, along similar lines to what it, uh, what happens today. Um, it has been built quite flexibly. Uh, we'll definitely have the dial turned around to the paranoid side uh, when when the system first goes live and all data will be reviewed by by your bureau um, but but you know that um, Sharon and, and some of her previous conversations has talked about some of the data quality uh, ideas uh, that are being discussed and so you know there might be ways that we can we can further streamline that but but yes the plan and improve is definitely that a breeder can log in and can upload uh, data directly into the system. Um, with the appropriate checks still in place. Yeah, great. Um, but a feedback as well as a question. Improve looks great. Can I also access raw data, custom traits, and custom indexes? Okay. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, raw data, yes. Uh, so what there's what we've got right now is raw data truly in the sense of raw. So it's a it's a vertical big monster, you know, like you'll see the trait name, the date, um, the value, and the animal details, and that will just go down. Um, what we are what we need to add in though to make that more usable than it is today is also the ability just to have, you know, um, rather than the animal details repeating down the page for every trait, we want to be able to have all the traits as individual columns beside the animals. Um, so I would say, yeah, we've probably got um, most of that functionality there, but we just need to put that final step in to make that just a little bit more usable than it is today. And then the last one was uh, custom traits. So I think that would just be traits that have been set up in in SIL. I mean, I guess I, I can't see why there'd be a problem there. Um, just list the trait name. Um, custom indexes at the moment is not something that we have got support for in the in the view system that you saw uh, demonstrated uh, just before. But um, but as a way of sort of trying to um, bridge that in the interim until we do add it directly into Improve. Um, there is another type of view called a report view. Um, and that's, you know, what you saw on screen was just, you know, very simple um, single table data sets, which, you know, most of the time is, we'll, we'll tick the box, but, um, um, what we want to do, though, is is make sure that there's more more finely tuned reports available, where a bureau can actually set up a, a report template where everything's set up to to be laid out onto, for example, an A4 page, you know, better for printing. Um, and in that um, reporting technology, that's that we've almost finished adding into Improve, it would be in there that those custom um, indexes could still be implemented for reporting. Uh, but but it is on our roadmap to go and add that into Improve itself to make that more widely available. Yeah, great. Um, are you able to generate genetic trends within Improve? Um, so we can't generate a genetic trends graph directly in Improve, but we can generate, uh, and actually quite easily, um, the, uh, genetic trend tables. So um, you saw the the table in the in the video. You know where I just went in and grabbed a um, a uh, an existing view. I could have just changed that view rather than being down at the animal level. Um, told it that I actually wanted to summarise that up at the flock level, and Improve would automatically start converting all the index values to averages. Um, I could tell it that I wanted it grouped by birth year, or um, you know, broken down by year, uh, by sex within the year. Um, so it, it is, um, yeah, it does have that capability to aggregate or summarize that that information up um, and in a, in a, you know, pretty flexible way of doing that, which would give you your genetic trends table. And then, you know, you could pull that out like you saw in Excel and then throw a, a graph on top of that if you want to visualize it. Yeah. Um, just a, a side note, um, Will the improve be available on mobile devices? Um, yes, yes it is. Um, and I should have said that actually about the commercial farmer tool as well. Um, both of them recognize when, on a, when they're on a mobile uh, device versus uh, a larger screen device like a, an iPad or a, uh, a laptop. There are definitely some things though that you wouldn't want to try and do on your mobile. Um, and there are places like data loading, for example, where you know if you're trying to work through validation problems in there to try and squeeze that onto a mobile screen um, is, is pretty Who challenging. Um, 
but um, but when it comes to other things, you know, like creating the views or setting up a view that like what you saw me using, I mean, they're just the same. You go in, you can go into those folders, click on the view. If you turn your phone landscape, obviously for a table, it looks a bit better, but um, but all, all that will work. And the commercial farmer um, tool that that is, um, it actually makes quite a few subtle and clever changes in the way that it's laid out to make uh, best use on a, on a mobile screen as well. Yeah, great. Um, final question, I think. Um, can I run a data audit on reports yet? For example, reproduction, connectedness, and summaries of my flock, i.e. traits used, size used, etc. Okay. Um, I might uh, need a wee bit of help from Sharon if I, if I wander off piece too far here, but um, so in terms of just standard views, we've got the ability to go in, look at um, any of the audit reports, summaries, so definitely summaries, um, reproduction, Sharon, I think we'd get that covered off already. We've got the summaries that will show you the number of progeny um, within within the flock or within other flocks. The um, connectedness, uh, I'm not too sure if we've, I, I think we might have a wee bit more work to get that surfaced. Um, size used and traits used, we could definitely do that. But I guess um, it's a bit of a catch all that we've got in terms of that reporting technology where, um, for, you know, if we wanted to sort of have like a bit of a dashboard report that sort of looked across your data from a few different angles, we, we would bundle that up probably as a, as a report view rather than one of those more basic quick views that, that you just saw us demonstrating, um, which I think is how we would handle that that report, um, sorry, that audit report um, requirement. Yeah, great. I think that tidies up our questions. Thanks, David. Um, generally, it sounds like the feedback's pretty positive. It looks really great and um, people are looking forward to getting into using it. Um, so to finish up, uh, a big thank you to all the speakers and contributors of tonight's presentations, including Brian Wickham, Robert Peacock, Andrew Morrison, Suzanne Rowe, and the very busy members of the Beef and Lamb Genetics team. Uh, we've had some really interesting perspectives and discussion points, um, which I hope you've all enjoyed and found interesting this evening. Um, think about topics you'd like to raise in tomorrow night's breeder feedback session. Um, for tuning in tomorrow night, you can use the same link you used tonight. Um, thanks for joining and we'll see you same time, same place tomorrow.